So good evening, everyone. Welcome to the SOAS Center for Buddhist Studies. Um, I'm Lucia Dolce, for those of you who have never met me. I don't think there are many, but anyway, <laughs> I'm the chair of the center, and uh, I'm very happy to welcome you to the first one of this year, uh, Robert H. N. Family Foundation uh, Lecture Series in Chinese Buddhism. Um, the series has been running by now for five years and uh, uh, has given us the chance to look at so many aspects of Chinese Buddhism from a very, um, well, from very, uh, various disciplines, uh, from history to art history to performance and uh, social history. Um, and th there normally are three uh, lectures every year in the series, so we'll have the next two um, at the end of this month and uh, beginning of next month, so very intensive uh, second term this year. Um, and uh, as uh, some of you would have already known, and I hope you have already registered, the, the uh, lecture series also um, includes uh, a, uh, an occasion for uh, uh, our graduate students <coughs> to have a more direct uh, um, encounter with our speakers, and so tomorrow morning there will be a, uh, a reading workshop, which I hope uh, you have registered or if not, please do register and join us. Um, so this, uh, this series has uh, uh, proven a, uh, a really uh, very interesting uh, platform for exchanging uh, knowledge about uh, Chinese Buddhism, so i like here yeah, to express uh, uh, my heartfelt thanks, the center's uh, uh, thanks to the uh, foundation for allowing us uh, to put up this program. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Uh, professor Natasha Heller, who is uh, Associate Professor in the Department of Religious Studies uh, um, at the University of Virginia, and currently enjoying uh, some time at uh, the Institute of the Humanities and Global Ca Culture of the same university, um, uh, w which is kind of research uh, institute, sort of mm -hmm. focused on research. Uh, Dr. Hella is a cultural historian of Chinese Buddhism with uh, research interest uh, uh, spanning both the, the pre-modern, especially the 10th, 14th century, and the contemporary. Um, her first book, which is called the Illusory Abiding, the Cultural Construction of the Chan Monk uh, Chongfeng Ming Ben, which was published uh, by Harvard University Press in 2014, um, looks at, uh, uh, at culture, uh, as, as, a, as a groundbreaking cultural history of uh, uh, Buddhism in the Yuan uh, period uh, through the case study of this monk, uh, Ming Ben, and using a range of sources uh, from poetry and calligraphy to Gongan commentaries to recover the various networks that were the force of Chinese Buddhism in late imperial China. Um, her other uh, very big interest in the, is in the relation uh, uh, between religion and literature, and uh, this is uh, what, has, what has triggered also a second monograph, which is a study of uh, literature for children, entitled The Literature for Little Bodhisattva, Bodhisattvas, Making Buddhist Families in Modern Taiwan, uh, which is coming up next year uh, with uh, University of Hawaii Press. Uh, this book explores uh, the uh, uh, inventive corpus of uh, Buddhist, Buddhist children's literature, uh, showing how uh, authors and illustrators engage with scriptures, commentaries, and visual traditions. However, today, she's not talking about any of this, but she is presenting part of a very new project, uh, which examines trees in Chinese Buddhism, drawing on literature, philosophy, and social life, um, very exciting project that will bridge the uh, divide between environmental history and the study of religion in Asia. So without further ado, I leave the floor to Dr. Heller, but please join me to welcome her to SOAS. Thank you. thank you so much for that kind introduction, and thank you to Lucia and Stefania for the, the, all the hospitality they've shown me thus far. Uh, and of course, I want to acknowledge um, uh, the SOAS Center for Buddhist Studies and the Robert uh, Ho Foundation for their general, generous support uh, of talks like mine. Um, and as you heard, uh, I, I tend to like to take on new projects that uh, require me to learn basically new bodies of knowledge. 
um, which uh, may or may not be wise. Uh, this is a paper that uh, I'm presenting sort of at the beginning of this project, and I would really value y your feedback on it uh, to sort of guide me as I go forward. So with that, I want to start with a personal anecdote. If you were to ask me about my grandparents' house, I would likely describe the interior, noting how the atmosphere of different rooms was defined by the objects within them and the activities that took place there. The warm feel of the kitchen with its painted green table, the polished order of the front parlor, the religious decor of the guest bedroom. I have really happy memories of my grandparents' house um, and, their grand and their yard that surrounds it. Um, and so much so that sometimes, you know, they've been you know, deceased for two decades now, that sometimes as part of my memory, um, you know, rec recalling them, I sometimes go to Google Maps. And you know how you can put yourself in a little pin on their street. Um, someone else owns the house now. The family doesn't have any ties to that little town anymore. Um, so I go in on Google Map and I drop myself on their street and I kind of look around the house. The last time I did this, one of the scraggly pines that flanked their front walk had been cut down. And seeing the stump reminded me of how these trees had framed my experience of my grandparents' house. The walkway that they framed led to the formal front door, and I don't recall anyone actually using that door, but then this created this space where that was of slight forbiddenness. Um, the trees cast this deep shade, um, and it evoked different kinds of play away from the watchful eyes of mothers and aunts at the kitchen windows. On that other side of the house was a black walnut tree whose fruits seemed to annoy everyone but my grandfather who loved them. Um, in short, trees turn out to be important to my memory, my memory of the space in which my grandparents lived, but recognizing this required shifting my gaze away from the human built. That I and many of us might overlook the significance of plants in our social and cultural lives is a reflection of what has been called plant blindness. As most of us no, no longer rely on the immediate affordances of our surroundings for food and shelter, plants have retreated from our everyday attention, if not our everyday experience. What we see and what we look for in our present environment shapes, I believe, what we perceive in texts and other sources about environments of the past. Our attention is trained not just by scholarly practice, but by the customs and habits of our own lives. If we do not regularly attend to plants, we may miss how they shaped the worlds of those we study. So the emerging discipline of plant humanities, I think, seeks to reorient our scholarly attention. Plant humanities is a critical interv intervention that takes an interdisciplinary um, approach to studying the role of plants in human culture in its, all its varied dimensions. And my discussion of the record of the monasteries of Luoyang, the Luoyang Cheolangji, uh, today is informed by you know, this kind of plant humanities orientation. Uh, I believe that the first use of plant humanities is usually credited to Yota Batsaki of Dumbarton Oaks, um, who leads an initiative under this uh, name funded by the Mellon Foundation. The term has been picked up by other um, botanical gardens, uh, including Kew Gardens, uh, and it's really no surprise that gardens and botanical collections have led the way in the early growth of the plant humanities, as they are sites of significant plant-human interactions, where scientific and cultural knowledge are already brought together. Gardens are a place where the field of plant humanities can be nourished because they are a natural object of plant humanities inquiries. The importance of gardens brings hum Buddhist institutions into the pure um, purview of this new scholarly approach, as monasteries and temples were often gardens in China as in India. Gregory Chopin actually made this point about 20 years ago, arguing that early Buddhist monks quote, attempted to assimilate their establishments to the garden or actually saw them as belonging to that cultural category, end quote. In India, at the time that the earliest Buddhist institutions were being established, gardens were to be found on the out outskirts of cities, and they were embellished spaces that disguised the less uh, attractive parts of nature. Indian gardens in the early centuries of the common era were characterized by walls, both to define the garden from the outside um, uh, and to divide it into smaller spaces. Waterworks provided irrigation, but also pleasing views through constructed ponds, meandering channels, and fountains. 
Bowers of trees offered shade and seclusion, and human-made hills allowed for taking in the views of the manipulated landscape. The ideal garden was a springtime one, offering seductions both aesthetic and erotic. These qualities carried over to Buddhist monasteries, according to Chopin, and the garden dimension of these religious institutions remained important for those uh, who visited them. Chopin puts it this way, quote, the Vihara, not the Buddha and the monks, is what they want to see, and there were, these were, in many instances, and from almost any point of view, quite an amazing sight, end quote. That Buddhist monks and nuns, too, dwelt in gardens is obscured how we typically refer to such places in English, which emphasize their human-built features. A monastery is defined as a building with its etymological roots in aloneness. Monastery is how Qian, in the title of the text that I will be discussing today, um, is usually translated. But Qian actually transliterates a Sanskrit term, uh, sangharama, meaning a garden or place of enjoyment. Thus, a more accurate, um, or at least challenging, translation of Luoyang Qian Ji would then be a record of the monastic gardens of Luoyang. Um, so this is actually kind of a long and bulky title. Um, so I'm mostly going to say like a, a record of, mona of the monastic gardens or a record. Um, so when I say a record, I'm referring to this text. I'm just not saying the entire title every single time. Um, so needless to say, we would expect a garden in medieval China to be quite different from one in India at the time that the historical Buddha is said to have lived, both in terms of the flora and in the aesthetics that shaped garden making. There was continuity insofar as gardens were the form or the container for Buddhist institutions, but the meaning of that form was determined by its specific features and by the plants within it. Uh, the latter will be my primary concern today. So let me clarify first what I mean by gardens in this context, um, in the case of those that serve as uh, sites of Buddhist temples and residences. So we can imagine a range of garden sp spaces from small plots that might supply a family's vegetables to vast imperial gardens and hunting parks. Uh, in addition to differences of scale, gardens varied by the social class of their owners. The Buddhist gardens described in a record uh, of the monastic gardens of Luoyang were most, likely, most like those of elites, and indeed were very often converted from secular elite gardens. Lay Buddhists often turned over their estates to en uh, enable the founding of a temple or monastery. These elite gardens were perhaps somewhat smaller in size than those belonging to the imperial family, um, but might equal them in inventiveness and luxury. Gardens were subject to social and cultural forces, and the medieval period represented an um, epochal changes from early designs. The features that characterized medieval gardens would come to define gardens in later periods as well. To put it an in another way, the medieval gardens of Luoyang and other wealthy urban centers were tremendously important to the history of gardens in China. There were two key changes. First of all, private gardens, as opposed to imperial ones, assumed a new significance. Second, gardens began to imitate the natural landscape. As Wendy Swartz has noted, views of nature shifted from inhospitable and dangerous in the early period to, um, quote, a safe haven from the world of affairs, end quote, which is the view um, the poet uh, uh, Shailing Yun took when he wrote his Rhapsody on Dwelling in the Mountains. Landscape, as Xie and other scholar artists of this period recognized, could do more than provide a retreat from official life. It could also furnish a spirit, spiritual experiences. The painter Zongbing, um, whose dates are 375 to 443, wrote, um, and working from uh, Susan Bush's uh, translation, quote, landscapes give form to the beauty of the way and humane people delight in them. Looking at landscapes could be a form of ethical cultivation and cosmological attunement. Zongbing recognized that it was not always possible to visit real landscapes, and so painted ones could stand in, allowing the viewer access to similar effects. Gardens likewise came to recreate nature. The imperial gardens in the Qin and Han had grand artificial lakes. By the medieval period, the ideal had become naturalistic waterscapes. Gardens on flat terrain were transformed through human effort to offer varied views. 
The goal was to construct a place that felt like being in nature, and gardens might indeed incorporate parts of mountains. The suburbs of Luoyang had a cluster of such private gardens, and among, that, uh, among them, that of Zhang Lun was one of the most spectacular. He had built an artificial hill, um, creating a series of views that mimicked a remote retreat. It featured a path that seemed blocked but was not, and trees so dense that they blocked light. While some criticized Zhang for his lavish lifestyle, manifest too in an expansive garden that tried to recreate nature, others saw it as a praiseworthy endeavor. Um, and praiseworthy in the sense of that it was extremely successful in achieving its aims um, as a private garden. So to sum up, uh, elite gardens in medieval Luoyang imitated nature so as to provide their owners with aesthetic and spiritual enjoyment. Monastic gardens had special requirements because they had both practical and aesthetic roles in Buddhist life. Uh, Chu Zhaowen, in his History of Chinese Gardens, identifies three environmental factors in the siting of medieval monastic gardens. First, they needed to be near water, as that was a daily necessity. Second, gardens should be located near forests, as they provided both pleasing landscapes and material for building and firewood. Third, they should be in a pleasing microclimate, um, xiao qi ho. Um, they should be cool, they should be sheltered from the wind, but yet with good sun e exposure. Seems hard to achieve, but there we are. Um, taken together, these suggest that uh, practical the practical functions that gardens served. To his list, we can add spiritual cultivation and sociality. Plants clay, pay, play clear and clearly different roles in all three dimensions of Buddhist gardens. Before I turn to the types of plants that feature in these gardens, let us get a sense of the text that describes them. Um, so this, the record of Buddhist gardens in Luoyang um, is included in the Buddhist canon. It's also included in many other places, published separately. It's not hard to find. Um, it was written by Yang Xuanzhi, whose birth and death dates are unknown. Um, not only that, there's actually some question about what character should be used for his surname. One text uh, actually changes the character midstream. So he's mentioned, Yang is mentioned in the further biographies of eminent monks. At the end of the biography of the famed translator Buddha Ricci, um, who died in 527 and lived in Luoyang. Um, and there he's identified as the governor of Qicheng, commandery. Uh, a brief excerpt in this text, uh, a brief excerpt from the Record of Buddhist Gardens is also included. Yang's work has been the, st uh, the subject of scholarly inquiry into its textual history and for its value for its uh, historical linguistics. It has been translated into English at least twice. Um, scholars have trans drawn on the Record of Buddhist Gardens um, for um, anecdotes about historical figures, uh, descriptions of Buddhist art architecture, and uh, to some degree for the layout of monasteries, but also for literary history, as the text includes poetry and other snippets of literature. So in his introduction, Yang gives a brief history of Buddhism in China, beginning with Emperor Ming of the Han. He writes that in the, jumping ahead a bit, um, he writes that in the Yongzha era of the Jin dynasty, there were only 42 Buddhist temples in Luoyang, presumably before its sacking by the Xiongnu. Um, after the Wei dynasty established the city as its capital in 495 CE, Buddhism flourished in all dimensions, from temple building to statue making, from personal conversions to sutra copying. This remarkable period lasted only a few decades, and in 534 CE, the city was destroyed by the military uh, commander, Gao Huan, um, whose dates are 496 to 547. Um, Yang says that just prior to this, there were over a thousand temples. Yang is prompted to set down his record by a visit in 547 CE. And on that visit, this is what he records as having seen. So this is, the, the, the next part is from him. The outer and inner city walls had fallen in. Palaces had collapsed. Buddhist and Taoist temples were in ashes. Shrines and stupas were no more than mounds of ruins. The walls were covered with weeds and lanes filled with brambles. Wild beasts made burrows in abandoned stairways and mountain birds nested in the trees of the courtyards. Wandering children and shepherds loitered in the thoroughfares. Farmers and plowmen planted millet on the grounds of the true watchtowers. And so it is this sad state of affairs that prompts him to his efforts. So he, he again, this is what he writes in this introduction. Now uh, the temples are all empty and the sounds of their bells seldom heard. 
I fear that their histories would not be transmitted to later generations, so I have set down this record. The temples were so many, however, that I could not describe them all. For the present, I have confined myself to the great uh, Sangha Ar Sangharamas, including medium or small temples only when there were auspicious or strange events or worldly stories associated with them. Framed by the abandoned sites of the city, Yang's work takes on an elegiac aim that implies, I think, a positive attitude towards Buddhism. His text proceeds from those temples within the city proper to those in the suburbs organized by direction. There is a difference of opinion as to whether the text is all of a piece or whether Yang intended to have main entries su supplemented by notes or commentaries. Um, the, what some editors take to be notes are not, um, as far as I can tell, identified by clear textual markers. And so I've treated them as equivalent in status. Um, I'm following also um, Ma Ling Luo's uh, uh, approach in this. So Yang's visit to Luoyang was over a dozen years past Gao Huan's invasion. He therefore works from memory um, and perhaps what other people tell him, not from what he's directly observing as he writes. The res resulting record is, as Manling Luo puts it, um, quote, what he believed to have happened and how he understood the significance of those practices, end quote. Yang and his work are also discussed in the Tang Dynasty text, the expanded collection for the promulgation and clarification of Buddhism, um, the Guang Hongming Ji, in a much different way. There he appears as quite fervently anti-Buddhist, identified as the director of the palace library at the end of the way. He, um, and this is quoting from this text, saw the dazzling expanse of temple buildings and how royalty and nobility competed to seize resources from the commoners. He wrote the record of the Buddhist monasteries of Luoyang to say that there was no sympathy for ordinary people, end quote. So Yang in this text is also said to have submitted two memorials criticizing Buddhism not only as extravagantly wasteful, uh, but also as false. Um, W.J.F. Uh, Jenner, one of the translators of this text, points out that this, the account of Yang here is drawn from an anti-Buddhist work, um, even though this is a Buddhist work, and it also significantly postdates Yang's life. So while it is possible to read the detailed descriptions of Buddhist sites as inherently critical of the expense needed to build them, uh, Yang doesn't really take up the opportunity to condemn them. Rather, I, I think he seems generally impressed with Buddhist buildings and people, if not terribly interested in their doctrinal dimensions. He's really interested in the stories around these temples, um, in my opinion. So before we go on too much further, we should also register the various terms for religious institutions that Yang uses in his preface. He mentions Si and Guan, which I take as Buddhist and Taoist temples or monasteries, as well as Miao, perhaps smaller shrines, and Ta, um, stupas. All these types of Buddhist buildings are said to have fallen into ruin. These, how, these, however, are not the focus of his record, and when Yang identifies what he includes, he uses the word Chelan, or Sangha modifying it by great, uh, da, signaling that the largest and most important Buddhist establishments in Wei Dynasty Luoyang were gardens. Um, finally, note how the non-human appears in the passage that I quoted about this destruction, right? Animals nest in places that would have formerly been off limits or inhospitable to them, while weeds and brambles quickly take over, remaking the human-built world. Buildings, when uh, abandoned, are often robbed of their most valuable parts, and if not man maintained, swiftly fall into re ruin. But the same is not necessarily true of trees and plants. The birds nest in the trees in the courtyards, after all, and those trees are still there for Yang to observe. Manling Luo is one of the few scholars to treat the record as literature in its own right, rather than as the source of historical facts and anecdotes, at least in English. Um, Luo argues that uh, Yang, Yang Xuanzhi foregrounds three major modes of placemaking, those are her words, identifying these placemaking as architectural, literary, and hermeneutic. The first two are pretty straightforward. People make places by erecting or modifying buildings, um, and by, um, but also by writing about places. The hermeneutic mode of placemaking brings current spaces into dialogue with the past, and Yang does this um, by, quote, identifying and interpreting the histories of specific structures and sites, end quote. Plants are also part of placemaking, both through human intervention 
as people bring trees, shrubs, and smaller plants into built spaces and through their own activity. As we've seen in the description of a ruined uh, loyang, plants grow without human intervention and may do so in unpredictable ways. Given that medieval gardens were in proximity and sometimes carved out of forests, there's also a dialogue in Buddhist gardens between plants within and outside of their boundaries. So let us start with two of, two of the most exciting trees in the record. So the first example that I want to talk about is a tree at a Buddhist temple that exceeds its botanical bounds. Yang's record locates places in relation to other places, and so we read that the Zhao Yi nunnery had a pool, and to the southwest of the pool was another temple, presumably smaller, as it doesn't get its own entry, um, by the name of Yuanhui, um, the Yuanhui Temple. Like many of the other temples in Luoyang, Yuanhui Temple was converted from an estate donated by an eminent literatus. Part of its transformation was the building of a Buddha hall, um, and in front of that Buddha hall is a mulberry tree, uh, Sangshu. This is not any mulberry tree, however. It grew five feet straight up, its branches spreading horizontally all around with twigs and leaves arrayed so that it looked like a parasol. Five feet higher than this, it was the same. Altogether, there were five levels, and the leaves and fruits of each level were different. And that last part was coming from uh, Yang's description of this. So that's not the end of the account of the tree. Um, this is a mulberry tree um, that I've pulled from. Uh, you know, because it's being recorded, I have to make sure that all the, the images that I use are um, in a copyright a space where that's OK. Um, so these are all um, images that, that, that check out for that. And so this is a mulberry tree. It does not have five levels. Um, and it's not able to find that. Um, so, uh, but this gives you a sense. I did want to pull trees because I think uh, images of as many trees as, and plants as I could find because I think it's important to actually kind of uh, look at and think about how plants look. Um, and I will note that, of course, there's a gap. Like, we don't know, um, you know, there are different species of mulberry trees. They look different in different places. So this is not, I'm not, asserting that this is an exact re representation of the mulberry trees of, of Luoyang, but at least it gives us something to sort of work our imaginations with. Um, so again, this is not the end of the account of the tree, but I want to pause for a moment to marvel and puzzle at this tree. So it's taken on this really intriguing form. It's got five levels that make it look like a parasol, and it has it taken on this form naturally or through human intervention. So it doesn't, the text doesn't say, Yang doesn't describe anyone doing anything to this tree. And, you know, leaves on the same tree can, you know, the other distinguishing factor is that um, the leaves and fruits on each level were supposedly different. Um, leaves on the same tree can look different based on where they are located height-wise on the tree and how much light they get. Um, that's, you know, that's a possibility. Um, there are also different kinds of mulberries with fruits of different colors. Fruits, too, might have ripened at different times. If there had been human intervention, it might have taken the form of grafting. And that's, of course, the horticultural practice of joining the tissue of two different trees, um, often selecting one tree for good rootstock and another tree for fruit bearing. And there are claims that actually the uh, practice of grafting in China, um, or that it, the practice of grafting began in China, and that it goes back to the beginning of the Common Era. Um, but more reliably, it is attested in a text called uh, the Qimin Yao Shu, The Essential Skills of the Common People. And this is an agricultural text roughly contemporaneous to the record of the monasteries of Luoyang, or the monastery gardens of Luoyang. So we know that they were doing, it was grafting there. Um, it's possible to graft together multiple trees, um, which could explain Yuanhui Temple's mulberry's distinctive five layers. Um, and, you know, in the process of sort of trying to figure this out or thinking about grafting, uh, I, in the process of Googling various things, it turns out there's something called a fruit salad tree. Um, maybe this is a, an American phenomenon only, uh, but where they basically graft several different fruit trees together. Um, and I couldn't find it, but you should Google this. It's, it's um, either uh, intriguing or horrifying, depending on, <laughs> on your point of view. Um, but they, so they have these fruit salad trees, and so that, that was kind of an image that came to my mind when I was reading about these. Um, 
so depending on how literally we take the description of those layers being like parasols or umbrellas, um, the shaping we might think of as actually being kind of like topiary. Um, imagining the small berry as topiary uh, or as grafted might be no more than a speculative exer exercise. We don't have any information in this text that would suggest one way or the other. Um, but we should not overlook the fact that people associated with the temple almost certainly had to intervene in plant lives on occasion. Um, the wonderment at the Yunhui mulberry does not depend on whether the tree is naturally this way or whether it has been created through human intervention. Whatever its source, the aesthetic of the tree is distinct. Unlike the garden views constructed to look as if the, the, it were natural, blending in with the landscape beyond, this mulberry stands out for its unusual, perhaps even supernatural, shape. And the shape might have well ex resembled a pagoda or a stupa or a part of a stupa. Um, medieval pagodas in China are often described as having five levels. Stupas were topped with spires to which were added discs called chakra or, which were pa or parasols. Um, and such visual resonances uh, would have added to the mulberry's specialness. Uh, the tree on the left is at the Oak Spring Garden Foundation. It's a holly, uh, but you can see how it's been sort of groomed into these different levels. And then I, I just think there's some interesting visual resonances there with uh, uh, that particular reliquary um, and many other sorts of reliquaries and, and stupa tops that you can find. Um, and again, this is sort of speculation, but you know, if we can kind of conjure this in our own minds, um, it might have been uh, possible for people at that time as well. So Yang includes the remarkable mulberry because it became a highly popular local attraction. So picking up where we left off in the passage, we read, um, this is quoting from the text, both monks and lay people called it a sacred mulberry. The crowds who came to see it were like those in the marketplace. Donors were also very numerous. Um, the emperor, uh, which would have been Shaowu of the Northern Wei, heard about it, despised it, and worried about what might happen with such crowds. Thus he ordered uh, Yuan Ji, palace secretary and attendant at the Yellow Gate, to cut it down. On that day, clouds darkened the sky, and from the place where the axe landed, blood flowed out on the to the ground. All those who saw this could not help but shed sad tears. So the unusual features of the tree led it to people to refer to it as shun, which I translated as sacred, but could also be translated as spirited, spirited or spirit. And not only did it draw spectators, it inspired donations. Given that he was later driven out of Luoyang, the young emperor Shaowu, um, whose reign dates are 532 to 535, was perhaps not wholly wrong to be concerned about crowds. Um, and nor did he trust the ta task of chopping down the mulberry to a minor workman, sending instead someone of standing to do the job. The popularity and sacred nature of the tree is a matter of some importance, but that it is located in a Buddhist temple is not incidental. Emperors were not infrequently worried about alternative claims to authority um, that religion might make, and extravagant donations were an indicator of popular enthusiasm. The tree drew the emperor's ire, much as the popularity of relics would cause Han Yu great consternation in the Tang Dynasty. The description of the dark skies the day the tree is to be chopped down might be read as an omen, although Yang doesn't explicitly do so. As for the description of blood flowing out of the tree, there's some species of tree um, with red sap. Mulberry is not one of them um, and should have a kind of whitish sap. Bleeding trees, however, are found elsewhere in medieval literature. Among the several anecdotes related to trees in the fourth century re re record of searching for the supernatural, uh, the Soshanji, there are two examples of bleeding trees. In one case, after blood pours from a tree and it falls, strange creatures run out of it. In the other, the retainer sent to, sent to chop down a troublesome catalpa, its canopy shading the wrong place, is terrified by the blood pouring out of the tree and runs to tell his boss, the local governor. Not intimidated by such strange happenings, the governor finishes the job. With the uncanny phenomenon of bleeding trees, we're in the realm of uh, Tzvetsan Todorov's fantastic, hesitating between natural and scientific explanations and those that um, would refer to supernatural causes. Whatever the explanation for why it, the tree was said to bleed, blood is an animating force, and in the record of searching for the supernatural, it is one way of marking some trees as special. 
blood plays a similar role here, attesting that the mulberry was not just a tree, but something more. What made it shun also made it bleed, and it made it into an object of mourning, um, if the people weeping when it was cut down. It's worth noting how this particular tree differs from others we will encounter, which could be described as anonymous or undifferentiated trees. The mulberry, on the other hand, is singular, and its individuating features make it special. The other exciting exceptional tree or trees highlighted in Yang's record is found in the, the, um, the Bai Ma Temple. Um, this was the, purported the, the earliest Buddhist temple that to be established in China, named after the white horses that carried back scriptures from the mission sent by Emperor Ming of the Han Dynasty, um, reign five, 57 to 75 CE. Um, this is recounted, as we recall, in Yang's description, um, both his introduction, but also in the description of this temple. The Silk Road associations of the Bai Ma Temple's origin story are continued in its flora. In front of the stupa, there were grapes different from other places, that's how they're, they're described, and pomegranates. Um, both of these plants had been introduced to China from Central or Western Asia, and both are associated with the general Zhang Qian, uh, whose mission, who died in 114 BCE, whose mission to the Western regions led to the introduction of these and other fruits. Zhang Qian undertook his mission at the order of Emperor Wu of the Han, who re wished to establish his relations with the, uh, with the um, Yuezhi. It was not a short or simple mission. Zhang was captured by the Xiongnu and spent 10 years with them, but following this delay, he passed through Fergana, Dayuan, um, in his now, what is now Easter, Eastern Uz Uzbekistan. It's there that he collected grape seeds as well as alfalfa seeds. Both of these were planted successfully, later, leading later envoys to, to the Han to comment on how well they grew. Of course, grapes were not cultivated primarily for, as fruit for consumption raw. In the context within which Zhang encountered them, they were used for making wine. As Robert Spengler writes in Fruits from the Sands, quote, grape wine became one of the most important commodities of the ancient world, allowing people to accumulate an agricultural surplus that could be stored for decades and to display their wealth, end quote. Spengler also notes that grapes were also dried, um, which is perhaps a mode of preservation more appropriate for a Buddhist site. Um, the grape here is paired with uh, another Silk Road fruit, uh, another image from not contemporaneous, but from a later period. Uh, and here the, the binome tulin is what's translated as pomegranate. Language is one way that we can try to trace the historical movements of plants. Um, anthropologist, historical geographer, and polymath um, Bertold Laufer notes that tulin seems connected to the Sanskrit term for pomegranate, which is dadima or dalima. Um, but it's not explained in Chinese sources as being a Sanskrit term, um, nor do th it, that Tulin or and it's, there's a variant of it appear in historical Chinese Sanskrit dictionaries. Given that Tulin was associated with Zhang Qian, Lawfer speculates that it re reflects a now lost term for pomegranate in an Iranian language. The more common term for pomegranate, um, Anshurlio, or shortened to Shurlio, is no less clear, or the origins of it are no less clear, um, or no more clear, um, but Lawfer speculates that Leo transcribes an Iranian word um, and that Anshur refers to Parthia. So grapes and pomegranates would have likely entered China if, if we believe this account of you know, Zhang Chen and so forth um, before Buddhism did, although perhaps not by much. Um, that they were planted at uh, Bai Ma Temple reinforces the associations of that Buddhist institution with the developing Silk Road and regions to the west. Through flora, the temple grounds could evoke other geographic locations. As an aside, we might see grapes and pomegranates at this temple as a kind of very small collection of the type associated with botanical gardens. Their significance was not limited to their mere presence because within the bounds of the temple garden, pomegranates and grapes grew exceptionally well. Um, and here's another passage from uh, Yang's text. Their branches and leaves were abundant and their fruits were exceptionally large. The pomegranate fruits weighed seven pounds and the grapes were bigger than jujubes. Uh, their flavor was also particularly fine, the best in all of Luoyang. When they ripened, the emperor would come especially to pick them. Sometimes he would then give them to the palace concubines. When the concubines received them, they would in turn present them to their relatives. Because of their unique flavor, 
Those who were given them did not dare eat them at once, and so they passed through several households. There was a saying in the capital, the sweet pomegranates of Baima are each worth an ox. The emperor mentioned this passage as, as according to sort of the uh, commentary on this, is, is likely Emperor Ming, to whom the introduction of Buddhism to China is credited. Uh, that he was picking pomegranates at the site of Buddhism's founding in China is a reminder of how plants become bound up with the movement of people and ideas. Spoilt as we are by um, international shipping, refrigerated shipping, and grocery store cornucopias, we should not also lose sight of how remarkable and wondrous new plants and fruits would have seemed. Uh, so to illustrate you know, this wonder, Baima Temple had a scripture cases uh, that occasionally radiated light, you know, kind of a miraculous way, causing both monks and laymen to venerate them as if they were the image of the Buddhas. Okay, that astounding feature merits one sentence, um, whereas the flavor, size, and social importance of the pomegranates are described in the detail that I've just given you um, right immediately following them. The pomegranates, as they passed from household to household, were juicy envoys for the temple. The wonder that the emperor and his associates felt toward the grapes and pomegranates was a positive emotion. But as we have seen with the sacred mulberry, unusual or marvelous plants could also represent a challenge growing beyond official control. We might also see pomegranates as a kind of proxy for Buddhism. The fruit from points west was able to grow with great success in a new place, akin to Buddhism's flourishing, as attested by Yang's work. As the fruit is passed from elite household to elite household, we can imagine that its origin was recounted to each new recipient, a physical parallel to the way Buddhist ideas and practices may have moved, their adoption prompted by social connections. Pomegranates also have another kind of symbolism. Um, in late imperial China, right, their multitudinous seeds were often likened to suns. Fertility meant posterity. More broadly, the metaphor of fruit is important in Buddhism. The results of practice are known as fruits, guo. Gardens create spaces for both kinds of fruits, real and metaphorical. Indeed, the successful growth of real fruits may have reflected the uh, attainments of the fruits of the Buddhist path, insofar as monastic grounds may have accrued a kind of supernatural potency from the practices of monks and nuns. Uh, moving in the other direction, the consumption of real fruit was part of the nutritional support offered to religious practice, practitioners um, in residence. So the sacred mulberry and the prolific pomegranate are individuated trees, even if there were multiple pomegranate trees, special in some way. Um, they are also caught up in narratives about important individuals, emperors in both cases, and are examples of what um, Manling Luo has called hermeneutic placemaking, here through trees. After all, the mulberry is not there for Yang to observe, having been cut down many years before. Scholars of landscape studies might call these witness trees. These are usually large old trees that are around for key moments of history and which often pursue, persist in culture, cultural memory even after they are gone. To put this another way, the pomegranate and the mulberry answer the question of what makes a garden Buddhist. In one case, it is a Silk Road tree that found a new and fertile home in China, and in the other, it is a tree whose unusual and marvel marvelous growth attests to the potency of Buddhist places in a different way. Turning from the Buddhist transformations of plants, I now want to reverse the direction and look at how plants might have shaped Buddhism. In other words, how do garden sites alter what Buddhism is in medieval China? So most of the trees we encounter are not individuated like these two, and which is why I said we're, I'm beginning with the, the, the two exciting ones, because they've got like, individual trees with stories. Um, and they don't, most trees don't attach the, uh, attain that kind of advanced age and special status uh, that is a pre prerequisite to bearing witness. Yet less prominent trees, and the, let alone plants, growing in multiples, one not readily distinguished from the rest, are no less important for understanding how flora has shaped places, including the religious sites of Loyang. So although I began with the two excited, most exciting trees, I would argue that the trees I now turn to are more important. So not surprisingly, undifferentiated trees make up the majority of trees in monastic gardens, and they do more to shape the spaces of everyday practice therein. They are co-creators of Buddhist life. 
One of the first passages in which, tr in which trees are mentioned comes in the first entry, a description of uh, the Yongning Temple established by the Empress Dowager Ling. While there are plants within the boundary of walls of this monastery, and I'll turn to these in a bit, I want to start outside the gates. There we read, um, outside all four gates are planted trees such as green scholar trees, which is, this is an example of one, extending along clear water. Many travelers to the t t capital took shelter beneath them. On the street, the floating dust was cut off. This was not drew due to the moisture of the rising clouds. Um, and the coolness brought by the, a refreshing breeze, how could this be produced by a silk tree fan? So what is implied by these final two sentences is that the environment just outside the monastery gates um, with its trees pro provides a respite from the burdens of travel. Um, and a minor point, the round fan that is either made out of leaves or, or resembling them indicates how plant products found were integrated into many, many areas of life. So scholar trees, as you might be able to get a sense of from uh, this uh, photo, are often 50 feet tall uh, with a wide canopy and they bloom in the summer. Someone coming to Loyang would first encounter the trees, perhaps take rest beneath them, and through such an experience begin to form associations between shade and Buddhist monasteries. Similar experiences could be found in proximity to other Buddhist establishments. The Jingle Temple bordered an urban ward in which a well was provided for the use of uh, for the use of all. It was called a well of righteousness. Um, north of this ward were quote several mulberry trees with luxurious branches. Beneath them was a well of sweet water. There was a stone trough and metal cups for the use of travelers who drank the water and took shelter in the shade of the, uh, the trees. Many took a rest there. End quote. And that's our mulberry tree again. Um, so ordinary mulberry trees like these generally grow between 30 and 50 feet tall, and they have a dense canopy, as you can get a sense of here. In addition to bearing fruit, they are perhaps best known in the Chinese context for their leaves, uh, which are the preferred food of silkworms. A row of mulberry trees would indeed provide ample shade, but it would also carry with it connections of a society that provided for all. Mencius claims that planting mulberry trees will allow the elderly to wear silk. Immediately following the comment on the shady well, um, Yang launches into a, a description of the temple buildings at Jingle. Although the temple, although the well and mulberry trees are outside um, and maybe a little bit away from the temple proper, Yang's account places them together. I read this as a way of signaling the qualities connected to Buddhist temples. They are liter literal and metaphorical spaces for shelter and rest. The grounds of Buddhist sites had to at least be part, partly functional, although such practical planting might be out of view or found of less interest by men like uh, Yang Shenzhi. We do get occasional glimpses of how plants helped provide for the monastery. In the entry for the Longhua Temple, Yang mentions two nearby temples, the Zhui Sheng Temple and the uh, Bao De Temple. And about these three temples, he observes, quote, the temples of the capital all planted various fruit trees, but the gardens of these three monasteries were the most productive, end quote. The garden of Jingling Forest View Temple was filled with rare fruit, um, although we don't learn, learn exactly which one or which ones. In a ward near the Baodou Temple, there were more orchards associated with, the, with temples. Um, so and they, they are described as follows. In this war, there were the three temples named uh, Dajue, Sanbao, um, and Ningyuan. Um, all around them were gardens that produced precious fruit, such as the Hanshao pears from Dagu, which weighed 10 pounds and turned into juice if they fell from trees onto the ground. People of the time said the pears of Baoda are like the crab apples um, uh, of Chengguang. Chengguang Temple also had many fruit trees, and their crab apples were particularly flavorful, the best in the capital, end quote. So this is a, a not from Luoyang, but um, the best crab apple I could get. Um, so we've got these pears, and what actually is really interesting to me about this description of pears is that they're a particular type of pears, and they're from a particular place, right? So we've got these kind of identifying marks, and then there are all these that are associated with monasteries. So somebody was, as they recorded here, was talking about this fruit with reference to specific monastery names. Um, and, you know, think about the different cultivars of this seems to be particularly true of apples now, right? Like that there's always like the next new apple um, and how that name becomes associated with, you know, the, with the, the best apple. Um, so Buddhist gardens produced fruit so good and so flavorful that it was to the talk of the town, right? Um, 
with these names that reflect the temple that grew them. So drawing closer to the main buildings of these temples, the impressiveness of the living quarters for monks and nuns is echoed in the abundance of plant life that surrounds them. At last, returning to Yongning Temple, we read, quote, the uh, dormitories for monks were imposing buildings with over a thousand rooms. They had incised beams and whitewashed walls. The doors had blue patterns and the windows had carved designs. It is difficult to put into words. Um, juniper and cypress, pine and cedar, uh, their branches brushed the eaves. Thickets of bamboo and fragrant grasses surrounded the stairways. Changjing wrote a stele that reads, the main hall on Mount Sumeru and the cloisters in Toshida heaven cannot surprise this, end quote, right? Um, so we have a cypress, um, pine, and cedar here um, to give you two, two photos and one painting uh, to, give you, to evoke that kind of description. So in this brief description of the marvelous architectural details, um, those details found, find parallel in the profusion of trees. And these are different trees than provided the shade for travelers. Four types of evergreens around the halls, um, perhaps matched in height by the bamboo. Uh, the Yaoguang Temple likewise had dormitories that were surrounded by greenery. Uh, there we read that the lecture halls and nuns rooms numbered over 500 with finely carved doors and windows one after another. Precious trees and fragrant grasses were beyond description. Um, beef tendon trees and dog bone trees, chicken head grass and duck foot, gr duck foot grass were all there. Um, and so people have done work trying to figure out what this is meant by. Uh, there's a text that identifies plants and animals in um, a portion of the classic of poetry. Um, and based on that, Wang Yitong um, identifies these as evergreens, hollies, water lilies, and mallows. Um, but I think that the descriptive names here are a reminder that plants are hard to identify and nomenclature shifts, right? Um, when I was looking around, what, was, what is called a beef tendon tree um, can now be connected with two different plants. So Yongning Temple and Yaoguang Temple were not the only Buddhist establishments where we read of evergreens. Uh, the Jingming Monastery, founded south of the city by Emperor Shenwu, um, whose reign was 499 to 515, um, Northern Wei, uh, was shaded by green groves in a beautiful landscape. Um, beyond the eaves, we read, were mountain forests and ponds, pines and bamboo, orchids and angelica. Um, this is angelica, all lined the stairways. Their fragrance were, was carried on the wind and condensed into dew. The pairings of evergreen and, and bamboo recurs in the description of Yongming Temple, Yongming Temple, also in the western suburbs um, and uh, established by Emperor Shenwu. Imposingly large with thousands of rooms, quote, in the courtyard were arranged tall bamboo and the eaves were brushed by lofty pines, end quote. So the juxtaposition of plant life and architectural elements with trees that touch the eaves and surround stairways points to proximity. The pines are not outside the monastery, uh, but right there. Why would it be significant to have these particular trees near where the monks lived? I think a hint comes in the descriptions of uh, Ningyuan Temple. There we read, bamboo and cypress formed groves. It was truly a place of pure practice in stopping the mind, end quote. That is maintaining celibacy and meditating. That's what's meant by pure practice and meditate. Uh, pure practice and stopping the mind it refers to celibacy and meditating. Here, the pairing of evergreen and bamboo are linked to specific kinds of Buddhist behavior. Bamboo is mentioned alongside pine and cypress frequently enough in this text uh, for us to think that this is a deliberate choice. And we can't know whether the choices are part of the gardening practices of the Buddhists of medieval Luoyang or if Yang Shenzhi has chosen them to make a point. But given how common the all three plants are, I see no reason to suppose that, the, that he's not sort of representing uh, what was actually, or what he believed was actually there, that Buddhist gardens did have pines, cypresses, and bamboo planted ne near each other. So um, these three trees all stay green during, th throughout the year even during the cold of winter. Pines and bamboo, um, pines and bamboo, along with the other evergreen trees mentioned, thus have associations with longevity, perseverance, and integrity. Pines can survive being buffeted by the wind, and bamboo bends without breaking. 
These qualities become metaphors for how a gentleman should endure the challenges of life, especially its political dimensions. By the Tang Dynasty, pine and bamboo had become associated with the plum tree and were together known as the three friends of winter. The qualities that the pine and bamboo re represent for the scholar official could be transferred in part to monks or nuns. Their lives are defined by constancy, um, maintaining the precepts and engaging in meditation without regard for external conditions. If the plum were at, all, at this point already associated with pine and bamboo, it is perhaps not surprising that it would be left out of the plant symbolism for Buddhist clergy. A plum blossom is also connected to springtime and beauty, um, less appropriate for representing monastic ideals. Pine and bamboo embody literati virtues that align with monastic ones. Thus we see that whereas Indian gardens privileged aesthetics uh, and erotics of spring, um, Chinese Buddhist gardens created new webs of meaning through plant life. In the description of Ningyuan Temple, cypress and bamboo are paired with what might be considered paradigmatic Buddhist practices. We have also seen passages in which monks' rooms are surrounded by flora. This is true of other plan places of cultivation as well. Jinglin Temple, which might be translated as Forest View Temple, described a meditation chamber, Chanfang, in the midst of a garden. Quoting from the text, within was set up a Jetavana Vihara, and although it was quite small, its clever construction was without compare. Moreover, the meditation pavilions were silent, and the contemplation rooms were remote, with fine trees close up against the windows, and fragrant, uh, fragrant polya surrounding the staircases. Although in the midst of the city, it seemed like being in a mountain valley. Monks who practiced quiescence had rope seats within, eating the wind and wearing the way. They sat cross-legged and counted their breaths. So this is Polia japonica. It's a flowering deciduous plant. And along with the unnamed trees, it helps to create an atmosphere conducive for meditation. The plant life of uh, Jinglin Temple formed a visual and oral screen between the meditation rooms and the outside bustle of markets and court activities. As a consequence, monks could undertake austerities and contemplative exercises more in line with aromatic sites. At another temple, plant life abuts practice spaces too. There, um, it's, uh, the, this temple is described as the recitation rooms and meditation halls were on all sides, you know, one on top of another. Flowering groves and fragrant grasses surrounded the staircases. There were often famous and eminent monks who lectured on Buddhist texts and shramanas who had received the precepts there and numbered in the thousands, end quote. So we're not given their information about how the effects of, uh, the effects of trees and grasses, yet they appear, um, as in other places, alongside descriptions that emphasize the success of the temple in the multiple domains of Buddhist practice, chanting, meditation, lectures. So for plants to create a atmosphere conducive to um, religious practice, they need to be cultivated with seasonality in mind. Um, Dadre, a temple located in, located in the western suburbs, was once the residence of a prince, which might account for its spectacular views of both mountains and rivers. The temple grounds were also planted with seasons in mind. Um, quote, when the spring arrived, the winds shook the trees and the orchids opened purple petals. When the autumn frost descended on the grasses, the chrysanthemums set forth yellow flowers. Famous monks and great worthies here dispatched their attachments through quiescence, end quote. So here we have colorful flowers, but again, right after that, this description of um, quiescence um, and the achievement of it. So this juxtaposition is instructive. Plants create the kinds of environment that are conducive to the most essential types of Buddhist practice. As we know, practice is facilitated by patronage, and here well-planted gardens also had a role. We have gotten a sense of how monastic gardens functioned as attractions in the, sacred, in the story of the sacred mulberry tree. This was true for other sites too. In the western suburbs of the city, uh, Baoguang Temple sat on the site of an earlier temple um, whose fruiting trees and vegetable garden were still remembered by some. At the time Yang was writing about, Baoguang Temple also had a garden. In the garden, there was a lake called uh, All-Encompassing Pool. This is quoting from the text. Rushes and reeds uh, covered its banks. Caltrops and lotuses blanketed the water. Deep green pines and emerald bamboo spread upon its side, end quote. 
This garden created such a pleasant space that officials of the capital would gather there, often in great numbers, to enjoy themselves in such pursuits as wine drinking and poetry writing. The sightseeing potentials of Buddhist gardens is a point of continuity with their South Asian antecedents. In another temple, converted from an estate, the Buddha's birthday drew visitors. And there we read, on the eighth day of the fourth month, men and women of the capital came in great numbers to the Hejen temple. After seeing the beautiful cloisters, all sighed, saying the dwellings of the immortals on uh, Penglai could not surpass them. When they entered the back garden, they saw the winding irrigation channels and stone stairs sewing upwards. Red lotuses sprung from the ponds, green duckweed floated on the water. The pavilions were connected by suspended beams, and tall trees reached up through the clouds. Everyone clamored over this garden, saying that even the rabbit garden of the Prince of Liang could not match it. That's a very famous garden that everybody knew about. Um, while the account ends there, we might speculate that providing sensational gardens for the wealthy to admire would have helped uh, generate donations and other kinds of support for Buddhist sites. The religiously advantageous environment of the Buddhist garden is a multi-sensory one, hinted at in the color of the lotus and of the duckweed, as well as in the description of the Dajue temple discussed a few moments ago. The visual dimension is clearest in Yang Shenzhi's description with the different colors of the orchids and chrysanthemums lending special qualities to each season. Buddhist clergy and visitors would have also heard the trees. When we read that the wind shook them, we can imagine the sound of the leaves trembling against each other. Tactile experiences of plants would have been more active on the part of human residents. We've seen more than one passage mention the, pass, uh, the plants surrounding staircases, and residents might have brushed against their branches or reached out to touch a thick bamboo leaf um, or the bark of a tree trunk. Fragrance was also an important component of what plants contributed to Buddhist gardens. The monastery was Shang in many ways, and of course Shang is the word for incense. At the Jingming Temple, for example, the scent of bamboo, pines, bamboo, orchids, and angelica permeated the site. Thinking of the use of uh, aromatics and rituals, we can see that sweet-smelling plants contribute to an atmosphere of ritual purity. The sharp smell of pine, the softer scent of juniper, or the aroma from a cedar's loose bark would have had similar effects. For flowering trees, scented blossoms turn into fragrant fruit, and as we have seen, Buddhist gardens often had fruit trees or were in close proximity to them. So Buddhism had a taste of sweet fruits that grew well in monastic orchards. The record of the Buddhist gardens of Loyang was not intended to provide us an understanding of plants in Buddhism. Yang Chunjur's primary agenda is elsewhere. However, what I've tried to show today is that a careful reading shows that trees and other flora were indeed part of Buddhist life. Shifting our attention in texts is much like shifting our attention in life, from walking by the plants to seeing them as central. When we change our focus in this way, we see how plants co-created medieval Buddhism. How did they do so? They could be reminders of for the foreign nature of the religion, living versions of statues from distant lands and as precious, in the case of the pomegranate. They could provide sustenance and spectacle, refuge and rest. They created a sensory experience and they facilitated contemplative practices. Trees and plants also demand care and cultivation. And as individuals such as the sacred mulberry could come to mean more than their vegetal status might seem to imply. Plants were an essential part of placemaking throughout Loyang and they did so not entirely within, hum with, within human control, unlike architectural, artistic, or literary endeavors. Yang Shenzhi recollects a recent past of Buddhist flourishing, a word that has its root it's in flower, and as Buddhism came to be planted in medieval China, it was alongside flora of many types. These were no less part of Buddhist gardens, which is what Luoyang's great monasteries were, than grand statues and soaring architecture. The junipers and cypresses brushed those eaves after all. Thank you. <laughs>